Hello, and welcome back to my bunker. Hollis here, coming to you from the nerve center of our cross-country move. And this week, I'm going to be bringing you a plethora of kick-ass music books. You're getting steamy memoirs. You're getting band biographies. You're getting oral histories. And you're getting broad retrospectives of music genres and scenes. I came up with this week's topic because my music bios are the last books I haven't packed yet. And if you're anything like me, you not only love music, you love to read about it. Join me for kick-ass band biographies. Ooh, honey, don't pack that one yet. Before we get rolling, I just want to give a shout out to my newest patron. Thank you, Mark. I'm eternally grateful for your help, Mr. Fiorentino. And I look forward to getting to know you in my DMs. If you're enjoying the content that I'm bringing you from week to week and would like to help support the show, please consider joining my Patreon. It's at patreon.com forward slash pop culture graveyard. And thanks. Okay, I'm going to start off with some of my all-time favorites that I think will have the widest appeal. It's the opposite of what YouTube wants me to do. First up, Trouble Boys, The Story of the Replacements by Bob Mare. This is a fantastic biography. It's a great music bio, but it also really brings into strong relief the personalities of the band, and especially Bob Stinson, who gets short shrift in a lot of other bios. You get a good sense of who Bob was and the demons that were chasing him. And as all of the band members' addictions and wild personalities got out of control, it's amazing we got as much fantastic music as we did from this band. Unlimited access, fantastic interviews, painstakingly researched. This is a clinic on how to do an exhaustive, definitive history of a band. Up next, The Hard Stuff, Wayne Kramer. Dope Crime, The MC5, and My Life of Impossibilities. Wayne Kramer is still with us, still kicking ass, before I moved from New York, one of the last shows I went to was at Bowery Electric. It was Wayne Kramer and Tommy Stinson. Wow, the guys from the two books I just talked about. With Clem Burke on drums, Jesse Mallon on vocals, and Walter Lure from the Heartbreakers on guitar. And they were playing like a motherfucker. I mean, they were playing like a motherfucker. But they played LAMF by Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers live. And Wayne Kramer... I was right up in front of Wayne Kramer. Let me see if I can find a picture I took at the gig. And he was playing his American flag guitar. And he played that little repetitive run that he does in Looking at You. But he, he sneaks it into almost every solo he does. It's kind of his thing. You know what I mean if you're an MC5 fan. Diddly dee, diddly dee, diddly dee, diddly dee. Oh, I just wanted to tear the whole building down. I was so damn excited. Anyway, this is the definitive MC5 biography by someone who was in the MC5. Grit Noise and Revolution is also good if you want just that whole Detroit scene of the mid to late 60s. But with this one, you get the MC5, you get Gang War, the band he had with Johnny Thunders, you get his solo stuff, you get him in prison, you get him forming Jail Guitar Doors that helps prisoners through music. If you love the MC5, you will love this book. Up next, There's No Bones in Ice Cream, Sylvain Sylvain from the New York Dolls. Syl got the title for this book from a short by the Three Stooges, and that level of humor is throughout this book. Syl was a sweetheart. He was going to be my first interview subject on the show. We kept trying to set up a time, but he was not doing well, and he passed away before he could be on the show. To my eternal regret, I'm still sad about that. But that just goes to show you how sweet Syl was, that he would even consider doing my little tiny show. This is not just a great music book. It is a fish-out-of-water story, him coming from Cairo as a kid, him going to high school in Queens, him meeting Johnny Thunders, him forming his own clothing line, Truth and Soul. He was in a band called The Pox. He later joined his friends in the New York Dolls. The whole triumphant upsurge and triumphant downfall of the Dolls is lovingly chronicled by the glue guy in the band. He could do everything. He was the one who taught Johnny Thunders those little, what he called, baby chords 
that would later make Johnny such a memorable lead guitarist. It's just a great biography. And if you love the New York Dolls, there are a lot of great biographies to choose from. You could go with Nina Antonia's fantastic, seminal text on the Dolls, which is too much too soon. She also did what I think is the definitive Johnny Thunders biography, In Cold Blood. This is a very fitting epitaph for the king of glam punk guitar. Johnny's partner in crime, Jerry Nolan, is also chronicled lovingly in this Kurt Weiss biography with a foreword by Chris Stein. Jerry Nolan, in my opinion, is a top five drummer in rock and roll. Come at me, bro. One of the most memorable parts of this biography is the time when he joined the Dolls and he instantly sped up and tightened the screws on a lot of their most iconic songs. Jerry, of course, took over after Billy Mercia, the original drummer of the Dolls, died. And there is a palpable difference in the sound of the Dolls pre and post Jerry Nolan. Did you know that Jerry Nolan and Peter Chris sort of grew up knowing each other? Peter Chris was very envious of Jerry Nolan's chops and how much fun he was having in his band. Jerry Nolan was very jealous of Peter Chris and all of the money and success and the high profile that Peter Chris was enjoying in Kiss. It reminds me of a story that Samuel Fuller told about Balzac and Dumas. Can't believe I just fucking referenced Balzac on a goddamn music show. Finally, if you're looking for like a New York Dolls encyclopedia, I suggest Trash by Chris Needs and Dick Porter. Sylvain Sylvain did the foreword for this one, so check this out. All of the books I mentioned should give you everything you need to know, almost, about the New York Dolls. Up next, Viv Albertine, Close Music Boys. Viv Albertine was the founder of The Slits. She was the guitarist. She learned guitar from her good friend Keith Levine, who was in the London SS and later joined The Clash and later Public Image Limited, where he really rose to prominence. Viv was roommates with Sid Vicious before he was Sid Vicious. Viv talks about the British punk scene back when it got started. She was in on the ground floor. She dated Mick Jones of The Clash. She went on several tours with The Slits. She details the recording of their brilliant full-length debut, Cut. And this is a fascinating account of life inside and outside of the band. Infinite Tuesday, Michael Nesmith. Michael Nesmith passed away last year. Rest in peace, Nez. And if you have not yet seen my Mike Nesmith tribute episode, please accept this as your personal invitation. Mike Nesmith was my favorite monkey, mostly for his sardonic sense of humor, as well as his interesting and sometimes idiosyncratic songwriting style. All of that is included in this book. It is a bit of an offbeat, off-kilter, highly entertaining ride, and I could not recommend it more. Up next, Rocks by Joe Perry. Yeah, I like some of the classic rock. If you enjoyed the fantastic Aerosmith biography, Walk This Way, which shifts perspective every chapter, each chapter being told by a different band member, then you already know that the best chapters in this book are by Joe Perry. So this is like getting uncut Joe Perry from the Walk This Way book. He even goes over some of the same territory as told in the book, but he's able to expand on it. In the world of hard rock, a world in which a lot of the rock star cliches played out to the nth degree, Joe Perry is one of those cool guys who somehow walked between the raindrops, and it's okay to like him no matter what genre you're into. Don't sleep on this. Speaking of great guitarists, Richard Lloyd, Everything is Combustible. One of the great guitarists in television, the other being Tom Verlaine, Richard Lloyd was always my guy in the band, a fantastic guitarist, inventive and jazzy at times. He would switch off seamlessly between rhythm and lead with Tom Verlaine, and some of my favorite solos on the masterpiece Marquee Moon are by Richard. Richard gives great remembrances on that original New York punk scene that centered around CBGBs. Things like Seymour Stein from Sire Records walking around with blank contracts in his pocket, inducing bands to sign because he was taking off tomorrow to go to England and he didn't know if he'd still want to sign the band next week. Sire Records, one of the greatest record companies, by the way. But it just goes to show you that Richard was everywhere and he had his eyes on everything. From the original television, through his own solo work, and then later to working with the great Matthew Sweet, who is a very underrated artist, and created some wonderful power pop albums. It is all here and waiting for you to enjoy it. 
From Richard Lloyd, we go to Richard Hell, Richard Lloyd's old band member from the original television. I Dreamed I Was a Very Clean Tramp is the Richard Hell biography everyone was waiting for, and it does not disappoint. It's a little on the seedy side, as you would expect, given the way Richard was, and some of the romantic stories, and especially the details therein, did not age well. But my God, this guy had the goods, and he is in three of the seminal bands on the CBGB scene. He's in television, the band that started CBGBs as a thing to go to. He started the Heartbreakers with Johnny Thunders and left behind a signature tune, Chinese Rocks, a Dee Dee Ramone song that Richard helped complete that would become the hallmark tune for Johnny Thunders and the Heartbreakers. And then he formed the Voidoids, the band he would form with excellent guitarists Robert Quine and Ivan Julian, and drummer Mark Bell, who would later become Marky Ramone. So Richard Hell was kind of the badass in a badass scene. And if you don't know how cool Richard Hell looked and came across, check out the films Blank Generation and Smithereens. Cool, cool guy. Up next, Cured, A Tale of Two Imaginary Boys. A memoir by Lal Talhurst, who was the drummer for The Cure. He started with them back when they were called Easy Cure. And if you want to know what The Cure went through back then, don't ask Robert Smith. Ask Lal, because he'll tell you. They did not go over well lots of times. And it's all in here. And it was part of the reason that Lal developed quite a drinking problem. This biography does what so many great music biographies do. It tells the truth. Lal does not pull back and try and make himself look cool. He gives it to you warts and all. He details the letter that Robert Smith wrote him, kicking him out of The Cure, because the situation with his bandmates became untenable. If you love The Cure's music, and you have not read this, what's wrong with you? I gotta tell you, I love The Smiths, and I've read everything there is to read on The Smiths. And for years, there weren't really any biographies worth reading outside of 1992's Morrissey and Marr, The Severed Alliance by Johnny Rogan. But then, out of nowhere, in fairly rapid succession, we got two autobiographies, Morrissey and Marr. First, I want to talk about Morrissey's. It's a great read. Of course, he is the most literate member of the band, so he's very good at expressing himself. Unfortunately, most of what he expresses are sour grapes. This is a downer of a biography. Shocker. Talk about a dog bites man story. In a lifetime of musical successes, Morrissey continues to focus on his mistreatment at the hands of Rough Trade back when the Smiths were a going concern. And he even chooses to focus on the court case where the rhythm section of the Smiths, Mike Joyce and Andy Rourke, chose to sue for back payments of royalties. It's just a bitter, bitter take. The glass is definitely half empty. And from the half-empty glass, we go to the cup runneth over, set the boy free, Johnny Marr. This biography chooses to focus on the positive. When he talks about the Smiths' years with Rough Trade, he talks only about how cool it was to be in the world's best band, whereas Morrissey focused on the fact that the American hotel room they were staying in had cockroaches. Welcome to America, Mazer. Johnny chose to focus on the fact that we were touring America. Isn't that great? And best of all in this biography, Johnny goes in depth on what it was like to craft these songs. He talks about when he wrote the music for Hand in Glove, showing it to Andy and Mike and having the song sounding good right away. And then Morrissey grabbing the mic and having his lyric sheet in front of him. And bam, the song just came alive immediately. Those kind of magical moments are peppered throughout this great biography. One of my all-time favorite guitarists and one of the most important guitarists that Brit never produced. To hear about more music biographies, please join my Patreon at patreon.com forward slash popculturegraveyard or check out my episode on underrated music documentaries.